Okay, folks, looks like we're leveling off. Thank you all so much for joining. We've got a great webinar today in store for you folks. We're gonna talk about maritime connectivity. Obviously that's what you guys signed up for, but uh, most importantly, it's not just me here to talk to you folks today. We've got a couple of experts here that deal with maritime connectivity day in and day out. Peplink gets brought into a lot of different markets, right? We have great technology that solves connectivity problems for just about any scenario, but uh, again, today we're going to talk about maritime, and so we've got two folks that deal with maritime every day so that they can speak more directly to the challenges and, and the strategies that you would want to take in a maritime environment when you're trying to optimize your connectivity. And so we've got Steve Mitchell, who runs a blog, Seabits. Uh, he's a, a pretty hands-on guy. He, he puts all this stuff in his own, in his own vessel and works with it day to day, and he's got a, a whole career in technology outside of working with Peplink as well. And we've also got Doug Miller, who is a Peplink reseller, a gold partner. And again, every day he's helping people get connected, pick the right solutions, and just solve all the little uh, surprises that you may run into when you're when you're trying to install these, these devices in a, in a marine environment. So we've got a handful of topics that we're gonna cover today and kind of walk you through this start to finish so that you've got a really good perspective on what, what strategies you want to take and what, what things you're going to need. And so just starting out, we're going to look at what is maritime mobile connectivity, right? What are we talking about here? What are, what are people trying to do? What are their options? Uh, we also want to just set expectations. There's a lot of different options here, and there's a lot of different scenarios or, or um, I guess, problems that different users are trying to solve. And so there's just a variety of different expectations that people may bring into this conversation when they when they look at how to get connected in a in a maritime environment. We're also going to help you just choose a solution, right? We're going to kind of walk you through those expectations and then start zeroing in on what solutions might be a good fit for this scenario or that scenario. And last but not least, we're going to show you some real world installations. Like I said, Steve and Doug, these guys are doing this every day on their own as well. And so we'll get to show you some of the installations that they've done and how they've tackled some of these problems themselves. So really the goals for today, number one, we just want to get you, have you get, walk away with a basic understanding of what we're talking about when mostly in, in this webinar, we're going to talk about the near shore scenarios. So, you know, maritime in itself is a pretty broad category of connectivity, right? There's all different kinds of, of vessels and users and, you know, from the recreational users to the, the long haul shipping type of users. There's a lot of different scenarios, again, that can play out just in the maritime world. And today we're really gonna focus mo more so on that, that recreational user, that near shore user who's not necessarily crossing continents, but staying closer to shore and moving up and down the coast. We'll help you figure out how to build a solution that fits your needs and your budget. Again, kind of mapping those expectations to different solutions that will solve those problems. And we'll show you what those examples are. So like we said, we're, we're gonna focus on connectivity when you're in the marina, right? A lot of people are on their boat and they're just there to enjoy it on the water, near the water. And so, you know, staying connected when you're in the marina is still a really big deal and actually brings a lot of challenges on its own, right? Even though you're right there next to shore, it's not always easy to get connected in, in a high quality manner, even, even when you're right there in the marina. Um, but obviously you wanna take your boat out on the water too. And so we'll kind of walk through what those what those connectivity options look like as you get further and further away from the shore. Uh, one thing to note for today's conversation, all three of us are based in the US. So, you know, we may talk about US carriers, US frequencies or, or something more US specific, but these concepts are not limited to the US. These are, these are concepts that can be applied universally, but just so you're aware, again, we're, we're all bringing kind of a US carrier perspective to this conversation. So just to keep you, keep you aware of that. So we'll talk about cellular carrier dependencies and coverage. Again, there's, you know, in the US, we've got three major carriers and each carrier has its own um, distinctions and advantages and disadvantages. And so we'll talk a little bit about what so, some of the things you wanna think about when, you, when you're selecting your carrier. And I think the, the big thing here too is so many people come into this saying, I want fast speed, right? I want fast speed. And that's kind of the, the intuitive thing that people are looking for, but speed is not the same as quality or resiliency. And so depending on what you're trying to do when, when you're in the boat, 
Uh, speed probably isn't actually the top priority to focus on. It, it's really about that resiliency and the quality of the connection. And of course, everybody wants to talk about 5G, right? 5G is everywhere on the, on the news and in advertisements. And it's a big deal, right? There's a lot of advantages that come with it. So we're going to talk about specifically how 5G might work and is it ready for, for a marine environment? So I'm going to hand it over to Steve and he can talk a little bit more about the usage and, and what people what people are trying to do out there. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Travis, and, and thanks for setting us up for our discussion today. Um, we're all really passionate about uh, the marine side of the world when it comes to connectivity uh, and excited to share some of the, the different ways we approach solving problems here. So knowing your usage. So this is one of the, the key things to, to start with when you're looking at trying to figure out how to get you know reliable connectivity on board. I use a phrase um, that a lot of people have probably heard, how do you cruise and how do you use? Uh, and, and what that really means is you need to kind of understand, you know, how many people you have on board, what you're using uh, the, the internet for, right? So if we look at that left-hand column there, um, if you're doing stuff like basic email, social media, and web browsing, that's pretty easy to solve. Um, if you're doing what we're doing here today, I'm sitting on my boat right now, and we're doing a Zoom to 160 some odd people, that's a little bit different, right? So you really kind of need to understand, you know, where you're coming from with how you use it. Uh, and that really does change the conversation when it comes to the types of equipment that you want to use, uh, especially when you get into the cellular plans that you have to pick. Um, and that really will, will, kind of, will kind of push you down the, the chart on the right there. Um, in particular, if you absolutely have to work from the boat, that would be, you know, something that you might want to consider calling mission critical, right? And if you're coastal cruising uh, and and within sight of land, that makes it more, uh, you know, easy to solve than, you know, being offshore or somewhere, uh, you know, in a more difficult location. So it's really, really important. And this is the the, the first step that Doug and I both usually start with when talking to people. How are you going to use um, the, the internet, and 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 what kind of profile does that look like in in terms of your usage, the amount of people that you have on board, and the different things that you're going to do? So really, there's three types of connectivity um, at at the high level that uh, that that we're going to be talking about today, uh, and you know some of these are are things that we're only going to touch on very briefly. Um, the first one at the very top is satellite. Um, the second one is what we are primarily going to focus on is the cellular side of the world. And then there's Wi-Fi. Um, and in particular with Wi-Fi, we'll go into a little bit more detail there. But we're specifically talking about connecting to a remote Wi-Fi network um, somewhere near shore. This is one of my favorite things to show people to try to help them understand the difference between things. If you're near shore, you're probably going to have access to all sorts of different options. You can use satellite if you have it. You can use cellular. You can use Wi-Fi. Um, if you're coastal cruising, which is really where we're going to focus most of our discussion today, you really have two options. So you have cellular connectivity, LTE, 5G, um, or satellite. Um, if you're offshore cruising, you need some sort of satellite setup. Uh, and we're not going to really talk too much about that today. Uh, we're going to be focusing pretty much on that middle slice, but we'll also be talking about how you can leverage uh, Wi-Fi uh, if you happen to be in a marina as I am today. Uh, so Doug, do you wanna take us through options for connectivity? Thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks, Travis. And uh, likewise, thank you very much for attending today. And, and hopefully we can pass on some of the knowledge we've gained in helping customers uh, get connected. So before we sort of zero in on the uh, discussion around cellular and Wi-Fi routers and that sort of thing, um, it's, it's worth just looking at what a lot of people have been using up till now uh, if you don't have a, a cellular router. Um, many folks have the you know, Wi-Fi bridges from you know, Wave or Microtech or that sort of thing. That works fine, except you're really dependent on the quality of the Wi-Fi at the marina. Um, and of course, doesn't cover you when you're as you uh, move away from the, the hotspot. Um, a lot of folks use their phone or um, iPad as a hotspot or a PC with a, a SIM card. Um, that, that can work well. And some of us have 
been trying to do this for many years, have done everything from hoisting a, a cell phone up a halyard on a sailboat to try to get good coverage uh, when we have a hotspot to, you know, really, you know, exploring just about every avenue there in combination with cellular boosters and that sort of thing. Uh, LTE hotspot devices are, are good, but, you know, somewhat limited and many of them can't uh, accept external antennas and so they have limited range. Um, I get a lot of questions about cellular boosters. Um, I tend to find these work quite well in, in very remote places for cell phone calls, uh, less well for data, uh, since they're really only boosting part of, part of the connection. And, uh, but still one of those things that, that's well worth having uh, if you're doing a lot of cell phone communications. The other side of that though, is if you have good data connections, Wi-Fi calling is becoming more and more part, important for, for customers who need to make phone calls. Uh, satellite, of course, um, part of the problem there is it's very expensive um, and fairly complex to install, but it's it's a moving target, and, you know, with Starlink and other stuff coming along. Um, I think we're going to see that progress fairly rapidly over the next uh, couple of years. And so we're, we're going to spend our time talking about cellular plus Wi-Fi routers and antennas as really uh, the area that we're we're talking about as the main solution set for connectivity. And this is really not just one or the other, but combinations of cellular and Wi-Fi together and possibly other WAN uh, sources for connecting to the internet. And so these products we're talking about provide essentially your full network infrastructure uh, for your boat as kind of the foundation. So one of the first questions I get from customers when I speak to them when they're just starting out with this is what is this you know cellular Wi-Fi router and I like to break it down into three main functions um, these devices are super powerful and do lots and lots of extra functions but the three things that really um, interest cruisers the most are how do I connect to the internet and then how do I serve the, uh, the users on my on my boat and so these devices, most of what we're talking about today, um, have cellular modems built in, one or two modems, um, and they connect to cell towers and provide a, a gateway to the internet uh, through a cellular uh, connection. But um, these often also include uh, the ability to connect to a public marina Wi-Fi or other public Wi-Fi and use that as your connection pipe to the internet or in fact, even combine the two um, for a little more resiliency and, um, and set up rules. So for instance, on my boat, um, I have it set up that when I'm in the marina, it's connected to marina Wi-Fi, I'm selling, uh, saving my, my cell data minutes um, or, or bandwidth. And when I cruise away, it automatically um, cuts over to a cell connection, and then um, that's all very, very seamless. So lots of ways to sort of get that set up for, for getting the initial internet connection. And then um, these devices also provide an access point or be, can be connected to an access point to provide uh, essentially the hotspot on your boat, your private access point LAN that all your users and devices connect to. And the router acts as the gateway to the internet for all of those uh, users and devices. So I think one thing that, that I've, I've heard a few times now is, you know, a lot of folks will often start with that hotspot approach, right? Whether it's their phone or a dedicated hotspot. And, you know, more and more they find like, okay, this one carrier is great, but uh, I need another carrier now. And then they've got another hotspot and it's like, all of a sudden they've got multiple hotspots and, you know, if you've got a smart TV, if you've ever tried to program the SSID on a smart TV, it's kind of a nightmare, right? And so all of a sudden you're juggling between different networks. And so I think that LAN connection that you mentioned, Doug, is, is really important and maybe overlooked because it's consistent no matter what you're connected to, right? Marina Wi-Fi, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, your TV doesn't know the difference or your laptop doesn't know the difference. You don't have to change anything on, on those devices to, to switch those networks when you've got a, a Wi-Fi router like this. I would also say like a lot of customers prefer having a single place to manage everything from. I mean, we were all kind of fine with having, you know, one or two hotspots and, and your example, Travis, of having to reprogram a TV. 
you know, that's a pain, but you've, it's gotten even more complicated because, I mean, you don't just have a TV, you've got, you know, a million other devices on board. And just having one place to do it all is a huge reason that a lot of people look at an integrated router um, when they when they come talking to me. Yep, makes sense. Yeah, I, I think, Doug, you had some some thoughts on just different considerations of the, the components in, in play here. Um, yeah, so, you know, basically from here on, we're going to start talking about building a real a real solution for your boat and and we'll kind of finish off with some of the special marine considerations but basically we're we're going to build a solution starting with the router that we just mentioned and then talk about antennas and access points and cabling and that sort of thing and even cell plans because that that's one of the key um, things you need to address sometimes even before you you decide what what you're going to buy on the hardware side so uh, we'll, we'll move forward here. And first of all, I'll talk about choosing a router. Travis, do you wanna talk about this a bit? Yeah, so, you know, like I said at the beginning, Pepling's got all kinds of different products and, we, you know, it brings us into a lot of different markets. But even in this conversation, there's a lot of choices that are relevant depending on, you know, what, what we talked about at the beginning. What are your expectations? What are you trying to do on, on when you're on the move here? And so, We've got a whole portfolio of different options and that you know at first creates a lot of confusion right because i mean here we are we've got just five different examples on the screen now and it, it it's just a lot to process for somebody who's new to this this industry and new to this this type of a solution and so the, the first thing i'll say is we have the, this variety of products for great for, for good reasons right there's different scenarios there's different needs there's different expectations and these come with different price points too of course but um, you know, we've got some more entry level devices that get you that kind of basic, reliable, just web email type of connectivity. And then we move up the stack with these dual cellular or integrated antenna and router type combinations. And then we've got really high end devices that you can use for, you know, multi radio. So we can do two, two cellular connections, four cellular connections. We can go even beyond that with some of our products. We won't get into some of those details today but you know there's just so many scenarios and so many so many needs out there that it's not just a one box fits all all types of solutions and so again we'll, we'll kind of step you through some of these and kind of pair map out what those expectations and, and product fits may be so you know i think one of the first things really to talk about is you know a lot of people are are here because they've tried to do work in the boat, right? And it didn't go well, or maybe it did go well yesterday, but today it didn't go well. And so, you know, that's just a really common experience, right? Cellular is, is an awesome technology, but it's shared and it's dependent on your signal strength. And, you know, there's so many variables in play. And so what works today may not work well tomorrow or minute to minute, it may fluctuate, right? There's just, again, so many variables in play there. And so, I think for anybody trying to do work on the boat, you pretty much have to start looking, start your, your search with a dual cellular uh, type of solution, something with two radios. And I think this is, there's a, it, it kind of gets into techno mumbo jumbo quickly here, but th there's a lot of distinctions that are important to be aware of here. So people will see a, a device that has two SIM slots and think, okay, cool, I've got, I've got two connections. Well, Probably not. You have one connection and you have a blind handoff to that second connection. So only one can be on at a time and it's going to interrupt and disconnect you as it switches over to that other one. And you don't know what the quality of that other one may, may be. And so again, it's kind of just a blind handoff. You don't really know what you're gonna get on the other side, but you know you're gonna get disconnected when you do make that switch. And so that can be useful for people that, again, they're not doing live video, they're not doing live calls. You know, just being able to kind of run out of one carriers connectivity or coverage footprint and switch over to another one. Yeah, maybe you don't need that to, to hand off sub second and seamlessly on your video call if you're just doing email, right? You can handle that minute or two switching time, no big deal. But again, for those of us trying to do work, that, that's not going to be an acceptable solution. You have to have that, that redundancy, that clean handoff. And so that's where a dual radio or a dual modem router comes in. In Pepling's case, our our radios each have two SIM slots. So you can do that kind of cold or blind handoff between those two SIM cards. But then when you've got two radios, that gives you up to four SIM cards that you can use at once. And so you've got two active at the same time. So you can do that seamless switching back and forth. Another important point to mention there is that there are other 
products out there that have two radios, right? They, they have those two active simultaneous connections. But the really important detail here is they don't work the same way that Peplink does. They're not able to use those two radios the same way that Peplink does. Peplink has something called Speed Fusion. So Speed Fusion is our software technology that looks at all the available connections and then it evaluates the quality of each connection real time. And we're able to split that traffic up at the packet level. So on a typical router or a, a, another company's router, they may have those two connections, but how they work is when you open up your Zoom call, it's going to look at those connections right at that split second and say, okay, yep, T-Mobile's got the best connection right now. We'll send that Zoom call out T-Mobile. But cellular is dynamic, right? Maybe, maybe a whole bunch of people just got on the network and started doing things on T-Mobile that weren't happening right when you started that Zoom call. So now your connection quality degrades, it slows down, starts breaking up. Those other dual cellular routers aren't able to react to that. Once they've established that connection, that's where your connection lives and dies. And it can only switch over when it gets interrupted. So again, you've got that other connection there, but it's still not gonna work simultaneously to protect those real-time applications. And so that's what Peplink does different is we're able to inspect those real time for the duration of your call and shift that sub second right in the middle of your call. And so we've got different strategies, you know, with calls, you want it as smooth and clean as possible, right? It's not about speed. It's about the quality, the consistency. And so that's what we've got, what we call WAN smoothing for. But sometimes it's just a simple device that you just don't want it to get disconnected, right? If you've got, uh, some device, it just needs to stay online, right? We can do hot failover. So you've got that sub second handoff. It's only gonna use one at a time, but it's able to switch uninterrupted to that second connection if that, if that first one isn't working as well. And we've also got bandwidth bonding. When, when you do need to just upload a whole bunch of files or download a whole bunch of files, that's where you need that raw speed. It's not as much about the consistency in that situation. So we can, use those two links at the same time to grab those big files or upload those big files. So if you're trying to upload a bunch of photos or upload a, a drone video, that's where bandwidth bonding comes in. And so the best, best thing about Speed Fusion is you can use all of these at the same time intelligently so that each application gets treated the way that it optimizes it instead of picking one or the other and kind of uh, not choosing the best solution for each application. So this is an application-based strategy that we can apply real time to, to whatever it is that you're doing. I, I want to interject to you on speed fusion and <clears throat> a multi, <clears throat> excuse me, multi modem routers. That is the single best and biggest feature that's enabled me to work remotely for as long as I have period. Um, I mean, having multiple connections to multiple cellular providers is great, but if you can't use that and leverage that, it doesn't really matter. And Peplink is the only one that has that kind of um, software feature that, you know, basically like what I'm doing right now, I don't, I, I'm connected and I don't really care um, about which providers I'm using because I have, you know, three cellular connections and Speed Fusion takes care of that for me. Um, there is nothing worse than being in a video meeting with an employee and having your cellular connection disconnect right when they're talking about something, you know, really sensitive uh, and having to apologize that your boat moved or something like that. So that technology is, 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 is the, the main enabler, at least for me, being able to work remotely. And it's, it's really, really uh, important to consider when you're looking at a solution. Yeah, I would encourage everybody to look at Steve's blog, his, his CBITS blog. That's, you know, Steve was aware of Peplink before I was aware of him, but that, that's how I came to know Steve was I just stumbled on his blog and he has a great article just really specifically talking about how he works from the boat and, you know, how he configures the settings and, and why it's important to him. And so I would really encourage you folks to go and just read through that because it's it's a really common sense explanation, right? It's it's not a, a technical article. It's it's just really focused on how do we solve this problem and make it easy to work from the boat. And so that was that was a, a fun surprise when I when I found that, that blog. It was really the I think the the cleanest, simplest description of kind of what the whole point of speed fusion is for a lot of people. Thanks. Yeah. This is uh, Doug. I'm just going to jump in and also mention, of course, this also applies to a Wi-Fi connection. So if you're in a marina right. 
and you have connections to the, the Marina Wi-Fi that are okay, but not necessarily super great, you can bind those with cellular connections um, to sort of smooth out the connection between the two. Um, and I even have some customers who have bought two modems or two routers and, and simply daisy chain them together so that they have one, uh, they've effectively built their own dual modem system. Um, so it's really, you know, there's lots of options for, for doing this, but the important thing is that, you know, you can get the, the sort of resilient resiliency you need for, for doing mission critical work. So I guess I'll, I'll uh, talk a bit about 5G and then hand over to Steve. Um, this is a question I get every single day. You know, we hear about 5G, I've got an iPhone or uh, an Android phone with 5G. Can I get a router with 5G? And <clears throat> the answer is yes, you can. And, um, and surprisingly, even with, with all of the and questions about how far can can 5G really travel when I'm you know offshore and that sort of thing, it does work surprisingly well. And um, having used a 5G peplink device now myself on my own boat for uh, almost a year, um, I wouldn't go back to to LTE only um, because I I definitely see the speed benefits with 5G, and surprisingly in our area area up here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I, I've seen times when I've had 5G coverage, even when I'm cruising up in the islands and, and quite far from a, a cell tower. And part of this is because, you know, what we'll talk about next is um, matching this, this router with a really good antenna. But um, the, the, there's lots of questions about where is 5G going? You know, what about the next generation 5G, carrier aggregation with 5G, all of that sort of thing. Yes, it's, it's a moving target, um, but I think for people who want, you know, super high quality, high speed uh, internet connectivity today, these solutions work extremely well and will work for years. A um, couple of years from now, we may see other developments that will replace these, but um, personally, I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon with, with all of the work that has to go into building a 5G solution, getting it certified on the uh, care, on each carrier, so. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that I remind people about too with 5G is, you know, it may not even be available in your area right now, right? The carriers have to roll this out. There, there's a, a huge, you know, lift and expense to deploy this technology, but at, at worst, these 5G devices are just awesome 4G modems too. So when they're not in 5G coverage, they fall back to category 20 LTE, which is basically the fastest LTE modem possible. So, you know, again, at its worst, you've got a great 4G device and it's going to be ready for 5G when that coverage is in your area or when you move to an area that it is in. So you're not kind of, a, you're not throwing money at, at a, at an invisible gain there, it, it's going to benefit you on the 4G side just as much as when you're in the 5G coverage. Yeah, and I think the the rule of thumb that I always use is that if you're going out to buy technology, you would always want to buy the the best that's available. You wouldn't buy, you know, a Cat 12 router just because you're worried about 5G stuff, you know, changing in two years or in a year. If you've already got a Cat 18 router. It's a little bit more difficult decision as to should I just jump to 5G? Um, you know, with CAT 18, you've already got band 71 support, which, uh, you know, for, for around here, for T-Mobile and those sorts of things is, is great. Um, if you're in the market for something new or if you've got an older piece of equipment, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't consider a, a 5G router um, because, you know, you're kind of, you know, protecting your investment. And when you do get uh, 5G coverage, uh, it's much faster. Um, I've seen similar to Doug, especially around this area, T-Mobile is really good, you know, 250 megabits of download and 100 to 110 upload, which is pretty darn nice to have uh, when you're sitting in the middle of, of nowhere uh, participating in Zoom meetings. Uh, but it falls back like like both of uh, both Doug and, and Travis have mentioned. So, you know, if, if you're, if, like I said, if you've already got a fairly complex infrastructure or if you've already got a CAT 18 router, um, you know, you obviously have to do a little bit more uh, thought behind should you jump on the 5G train now or wait uh, and, and do something a little bit later. But it's definitely viable technology and very, very fast. 
And I think the last thing that I'll throw out there in, in favor of a 5G device today is, you know, for anybody who's crossing international borders, right? The, for, for years, you've had to be really specific about which devices you bought, depending on which regions you were going to, right? Because different networks around the world use different frequencies and, and they're, you know, they're just, they have different strategies for how they, how they get people connected. And the 5G devices are the most global devices we sell. So they, these are a single SKU, truly global device. And so if you've got a 5G device in your boat, you've got the best connectivity possible as you do cross those international borders and use carriers that you you may not use uh, when, when you're in your home country. And so you've just got even more compatibility when, when you use the 5G devices versus the 4G devices. So I'll jump over to antennas now because really all of this is great, but it's only as good as the weakest link in the chain. And so the antenna is really the linchpin in, in terms of staying connected, especially when you get further and further from that cellular tower. And so uh, having, a, having a high quality, high performance antenna is, is an absolutely critical piece to this puzzle, right? Our devices come with the, the little uh, stick antennas, right, that screw on and just kind of sit inside. And if all you're ever gonna do is sit in the marina, that, that'll probably work fine, right? That, that's probably gonna be just, just fine. But again, the further you get away from shore, the more important that these, these antennas are. And, you know, with 5G, again, every antenna is not the same. You have to have 5G optimized antennas because 5G covers so many different frequencies. So you have to have antennas that are designed to cover that range and designed to perform well at the bottom and the top of those frequencies, right? You've got really low frequencies that cover really far. And then you've got these really high frequencies that give you all the speed and capacity. And you've got to be able to be optimized on both of those to, to have a good clean experience as you go about. And so you know, Peplink, a couple of years ago, we really, we really realized that we needed to invest more, more effort into our, our antennas, right? In, in the past, we didn't have our own antenna line. We worked with third parties or maybe we white labeled some stuff, but we realized, you know, we're, we're selling into so many specialty markets that we really need to focus in on what users need in each different market and really create antennas that are designed to match up with, with the devices that we're selling so that it's the best possible experience every time. And so that, that's, what, that's what we did. We invested in, in dedicated resources to create our own design, our own antenna product line. And we worked with people who are experts in these different industries. So we have maritime specific antennas that work great for those scenarios, right? There's, there's nuances and, and reasons why you need a different antenna for a maritime environment versus you know, a, a kiosk that's sitting in a stadium, right? They're just two totally different situations. And so... I'm just really pleased to see the results now. We've got, again, these maritime antennas, we've got mobility antennas, we've got IoT antennas, and they all just work great, right? We've got a lot of people in these industries that are giving us just great reviews, great feedback. And I think the best thing is, is we're not done, right? We, we've got these antennas, but you know, we're still collecting tons and tons of feedback from people in the maritime industry so that we can keep making more antennas, keep coming up with even better solutions out there. And so again, just don't don't ignore the antenna. It might be the the least interesting part of the part of the solution, but oftentimes it might be the most important part at the same time. And there's all kinds of details that I'll let uh, Doug and Steve get into when it comes to choosing an antenna and getting that antenna connected. So we'll talk a little bit about some examples, some mounting examples, and this is really just touching the tip of the iceberg here, but. Um, there, there are kind of two strategies with antennas. You can go with these dome form factor style antennas, uh, the mobility series. Um, these are, you know, when you want a low profile antenna, but still get uh, some, some decent gain from the external antenna, um, or you have a high speed vessel, uh, these are great. I mean, they're um, nice small form factor, but, but still give you huge performance advantages. Uh, Peplink have, have designed some specific mounting options for these that address the marine industry. So over on the left here, we have the ACW 652. It's a really just a standard one inch, 14 thread per inch mount. This could be any mount. This could be a Shakespeare or ratchet mount or whatever. Um, and secondly, there's this collar essentially it fits on and then you can fit your mobility antenna on there. So you can see in the uh, second picture, an example of mounting that on a rail. 
um, and getting it uh, outside the boat uh, to optimize the connection. Um, the third picture is, is uh, kind of a solution I threw together when these first came out on my own sailboat, um, put it on a, a Morad extension pole, um, five foot pole on my Davit system on the sailboat and was able to get the antenna nice and high and most importantly, free and clear of, of other obstacles around it. And so this is what I sailed with for about nine months. Um, got fabulous reception in places I had no business getting reception up in the San Juan Islands and back bays there um, down in the South Sound uh, worked extremely well. Uh, again, you wanna get these away from a lot of other metal clutter um, and that'll give you the best chance of getting a good signal. I've recently replaced it in the, the next picture with the, uh, the new 40G, the Maritime 40G, uh, and have been testing that out, the similar sort of idea on a pole on the uh, stern rail. Um, this is a big antenna, but boy, does it work really well. So um, I'm looking forward to testing this uh, some more this summer. And then uh, finally, uh, you know, a typical powerboat mounting system up on a, an arch or an antenna ray system. Again, you want to get this in a place where it's, it's not too close to other antennas um, and out of the path of radar and things like that. So just keep in mind, you know, it's not just antenna separation. It's also metal structure of any type is going to do some somewhat uh, some blocking of the signal. So keeping it free and clear is, is definitely a, a big priority. So, you know, coupled with this are antenna cables, and that's, you know, probably one of the most important areas, which is, you know, you need a cable running to your antenna, but it needs to be relatively short. Um, I've included a little calculator from uh, Times Microwave on the right here, and you can go and look at this yourself. Um, you can see as we're talking about these high frequencies with cellular, like up in the 5000 range, you know, a long cable length run of say 30 feet um, with LMR 195 uh, style antenna cable is, is really not going to work. You, you've got a way too much loss. So the goal is to get your rudder as close as possible to the antennas. And there's lots of creative ways of doing that. Um, some people have put them in unused satellite domes, some put them in waterproof enclosures and lazarettes and things like that. But uh, try to keep your cable run probably no more than 20 feet. If it's going to be longer than that, then you have to seriously start thinking about LMR 400 and other higher um, length uh, scenarios for, for your cables that, that will be able to withstand the loss that's going to happen at these higher frequencies. I think there, there's always that, uh, uh, you know, people are used to coaxial cable, right, from TV over the air or maybe two-way radios, right, and those are low frequencies, and so they they run over those cables really well. They don't have that loss like like you see on the, these these LTE and 5G signals, and so there's always that um, kind of knee-jerk reaction, like, oh, we'll just run a long cable to it, and that, that can be a huge mistake. You can completely cancel out all the gain your antenna has and, and really work backwards almost even from what you had with that little stick antenna directly connected. So th these details matter a lot, unfortunately. I mean, it's just a lot of layers to consider, but again, that's why we've got people that do this every day and understand the, these trade-offs. And that's why we partner with these people to, to help people find the right solution without having to become an expert in cabling and antennas and LTE and all these different layers. I'd, I'd say the number one challenge or mistake I see with, with most of the installs that maybe didn't follow <laughs> the suggestions is in antenna cabling and in antenna placement. Um, you know, using high quality cable is a must. I would never go over 20, 25 feet, no matter what the cable is. Somebody asked in QA in the, or in the question and answers, uh, can we put it at the top of a sailboat mast? No, I would never do that. There's lots of interference up there from VHF antennas, LED anchor lights, plus you've got all the power wires and all the things that it needs to go by, plus it's just too long. It used to be back in the day, if you were using a Wi-Fi booster, that getting it as high as possible was important so that you had better line of sight. And for cellular, you're dealing with such small improvements in terms of the the gain from an antenna it needs to be as close to the router as possible so it's, it's really important to make sure that you don't cut corners there 
Yeah, and there's there's always the the trade off. I mean, antennas aren't pretty, right? They're they're just kind of they're just there, and so there's always the aesthetics versus performance thing too, right? I mean, aesthetics matter, especially when you somebody spent a lot of money on the the boat that they've got, right? They want it to look good, and so there's kind of a, a natural conflict there sometimes, and so it's just something to consider, right? It, there, there's good there's great places to put an antenna and there's terrible places to put an antenna and so sometimes you have to find a balance between you know the looks and the performance there and and find that right fit but yeah you can't always put it in the most optimal location either right sometimes aesthetics are way a little heavier on the scale than the performance does but just being aware of those trade-offs i think is, is the biggest thing to to keep in mind yeah, so one of the things that um, I always want to bring up when talking with somebody is is Wi-Fi um, WAN or Wi-Fi as WAN, and what that is is it's the ability for a router or device to connect to a local Wi-Fi network and use that as a source of internet. Um, I'm actually connected right now to two Wi-Fi networks and three cellular networks, and by default, those two Wi-Fi networks where I am here uh, are being used for the majority of, of the session today for me to, to participate. Um, it saves you data, right? I mean, we all have data plans. Yes, some of us have unlimited cellular data plans, but there's still limits to those unlimited plans. They slow you down at a certain point or there's other challenges. Or in the case of where I am uh, near Seattle in a particular marina, the cellular coverage here is abysmal. So Wi-Fi is, is almost required for that. Um, so when you're thinking of a solution, you you want to also think about having uh, a potentially having an external antenna that's specifically to grab remote Wi-Fi um, and, and using that particular feature to pull in uh, that Wi-Fi network uh, and have that be your primary source uh, combined with a, a cellular modem. Uh, somebody asked in the Q and A as well. I, you know, Speed Fusion isn't, uh, you know, going to work for me on my BR1 Pro 5G. It actually will because you could use Wi-Fi as WAN in this example, connect to a local Wi-Fi network, still have your 5G connection running as well. Use Speed Fusion to combine those, and both of those will be used so that you're always connected, uh, and and you know, make make sure that you're not having any sort of outage while. Uh, while you're while you're dealing with that, so it's it's not just good enough to to say okay, I'm going to use Wi-Fi as WAN. It's something when we talk about a design, we actually may suggest having a dedicated antenna for that and not using the access point on the router itself. Yeah, there there can be a trade off there if you're you know that 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 BR1 Pro 5G. It has a a single Wi-Fi radio, and so you can connect that to the the Wi-Fi as WAN. You can connect that to the Marina Wi-Fi, and then you can also use it to get your devices connected. But there's limits to what what you can do in that situation, right? It's going to kind of it has to share its time between connecting to the, the the Marina and then connecting to the laptop, and so it's it's kind of going back and forth, back and forth, right? It's kind of relaying everything. And that's that's chewing up at at, at best half of its time. And if, if the signal is not great, then it just kind of degrades further and further. So again, this kind of comes back to what your expectations and your use cases are. If you're just doing web browsing, yeah, use it, use it for both. That's probably going to be okay. But if you start getting more devices and more, more demand, th then you need to start looking at how you kind of separate those two functions. Well, and, and I think one of the things that I see a lot of, a lot of what I spend time doing outside of the cellular world is marinas and Wi-Fi setups within marinas. Marinas are one of the worst places in the world to try to get Wi-Fi working correctly because there's all these other Wi-Fi networks from every chart plotter and Vesper AIS device. And then you've got metal and glass and big stick things on these sailboat things that are always in my way going slowly. Uh, and that all causes huge amounts of interference. So even if you aren't, you know, going to put an outdoor antenna for Wi-Fi to do that, you're going to, you're still going to be dealing with all that interference and, and it is a challenge. There were two related Q and A's. One was, um, what about public Wi-Fi with captive portal for Wi-Fi access? Yes, you can use Wi-Fi as WAN for that. And there's steps to do that. Um, so it, it's definitely something to look at. Um, and the way we usually recommend folks address that is use the radio on the router to get that remote Wi-Fi um, pulled into the router and, and into your environment, and then use an access point 
uh, on the boat dedicated to serving, you know, the, the local clients and people and devices and everything that are there. Um, one of the things it did come up as a Q&A as well, I already answered it. There, there are a lot of folks that don't realize that the PepWave routers actually will manage and control this access point. You don't need another you know, piece of software. You don't need a, an extra license. You don't have to go log into something else. It's all controlled from that same central point. Um, so it, it can be very, very convenient. Doug, did you have any comments on this particular um, yeah, so this is definitely my preferred recommended route to use a, a separate access point in the cabin and dedicate your router to the external communications. Um, if you get a chance, go to our site, uh, onboardwireless.com, um, and I've got a blog area, and I have a whole article uh, about how to manage your, your PepLink access point from your router or individually. So um, there, you can do everything from just plug them in and and have the router configure it or or actually manage it yourself so lots of good options there i think in the interest of time we'll keep pushing forward and um i'll talk a little bit more and steve will as well about how we've used access points on our own boats so let's jump ahead and um this next slide is really just kind of a um a a you know, a concept slide of, of putting an HD dome, HD1 or HD2 on the top of a sailboat mast. In reality, this is pretty hard to do on a sailboat that has, you know, VHF antennas and LED anchor lights and uh, wind vanes and all sorts of things up there. Um, one scenario that I've been looking at for a couple of customers uh, and has worked well is putting it on a mizzen mast if you have one or on an arch on the on the davits. That case you're, you're getting it away from all the other clutter and this can work well to get the radio and the antennas in a single place and minimize loss because that communication pipe from the the dome down to the sim injector or the switch down in your cabin um, can be is is Ethernet and essentially is lossless. So um, won't go into a lot of detail about this particular solution, but this is another way to to look at it. It is um, one of the more popular solutions that we see, though, because yes. of the simplicity and not having to deal with antennas. But yeah, we're not going to talk a great deal about it today. Oh, I was just going to say the important thing is is that you can put this dome literally anywhere and just have a single Ethernet cable run down to your power over ethernet inserter or the sim injector and manage the device from from below but have literally zero loss between the uh the dome and the rest of your your network yeah you you basically said exactly what i was going to say it, it's a good balance when you've got that too long of a cable run situation if if that's what you're faced with the dome might be the better choice right i, I think the dome as an antenna itself, it isn't as good as some of those maritime antennas, but when you factor out the, the lack of cable to lose signal, depending on the situation and the location, you may come out ahead with the dome versus a, a dedicated maritime antenna. So just more trade-offs to consider. I mean, again, nobody said this was going to be easy, right? But again, we've got people that understand it and can navigate you, you through these things in your scenario. So speaking of rabbit holes and, and uh, places to get stuck and, and need an expert, um, how, can you guys just talk a little bit about cellular data plans? Because I think this is really often overlooked as well as another, yet another challenge or roadblock for people trying to trying to stay connected. Yeah, I, I mean, this to me is the first question you need to answer before you even purchase hardware. I mean, you could have the best hardware in the world, but if you don't have adequate plans, if you buy a duo router with the dual modems and you have a single SIM card, you're not you're not going to get any of the benefits of that dual 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 modem. And the challenge is for us, you know, we we try to recommend what we've used and what we've seen, but it's a constantly changing landscape. Um, the carriers will offer a plan and then they won't offer it. They'll offer it in one part of the U.S. and not and not elsewhere. They don't tell you that they do, but it ends up that way. And then there's challenges getting them activated. And most of the carriers don't understand what a lot of this gear is. Um, PepLink is very prevalent in pushing through certifications and getting that, that done with the different carriers. But their frontline folks that you talk to are selling cell phones. They're not dealing with routers. 
So it's really important that you find good plans um, and make sure you, you that you have, you know, back to that first slide that we talked about way back when, which is where do you cruise and how do you use? If you're going to be constantly streaming Netflix, then you're going to need to invest some time and effort in finding really good plans, um, you know, that that can that can support that habit. Um, you know, we we usually recommend anything that has to do with a hotspot or router plan, those are the best. Trying to tag a plan on to something that you already have uh, from a personal cell phone perspective usually creates a lot more, more issues. Um, but Doug, I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, I think one thing is, uh, you know, as Steve said, do some research. Steve has a great article on this. I have an article focused exclusively on how to choose a cell plan. There's other folks out there like the mobile in internet uh, info folks uh, that have articles on this as well. So do your research. Uh, one of the big things uh, in our area is also knowing what the policy is for roaming, because if you go up to Canada, you want to make sure that your, your system continues to work up there. And also be sure that you know how to use Wi-Fi WAN, because you may find up in Canada or the Bahamas or whatever, um, that connecting to Wi-Fi hotspots will actually be the method of choice uh, in order to save dollars on, on cell plans. So let's, uh, let's keep moving, because we're, we're starting to get close to our end time here. I'm going to throw uh, one more comment here on data plans sure. quick, Doug. Um, so you know, we've talked about kind of if you're trying to do work from the boat, you need two cellular connections, right? And to some people, that's just an insane proposition, right? It's like, okay, I went through all this, all this research and headache, and I picked whichever carrier I picked, right? I found the right plan for me. But now you're telling me I have to go do that again, and do all that with another carrier and spend, you know, spend the money on yet another connection. And so some to some people, that's kind of the, the limit that they're willing to go to. And so um, just a couple of weeks ago, we launched something called Speed Fusion Connect. And so that's a that's a data plan that's available on some of our newest devices that is really a, a data plan of convenience. So if you've got that first data plan, that's going to be your primary connection, right? You found the lowest cost per gig, you found the package that's going to fit your usage, that's great. But when you're trying to do those video calls, that second connection is really important. And so, you know, that Speed Fusion Connect connection may not be great for your primary connection, but if you're using it only for WAN smoothing to only protect Zoom or Teams, that might make a lot more sense, right? All of a sudden that, that makes more sense because you don't have to pay for it every month and spend all that extra money. If you are an absolute power user and you're working from the boat every day, it's probably worth your investment to, to get those two dedicated cell plans direct from a carrier. But just so people are aware, we have a, a new option on some of the new devices to kind of help take away the pain of that, that second connection research and, and cost. So. I think to sum all this up, there's just a lot to consider here, right? I mean, there are so many boxes that you need to check when you look through and really try to find the right fit to, to do what you're trying to do. And so again, we've got experts just like Steve and Doug here to help you folks navigate through that. They've got great content. They write all kinds of articles to help you navigate this. And so you got to do a little research. And when you're fed up with research, we, we've got the right people to, to help you step through that and figure out how to how to check these boxes without having to figure it all out yourself. So Doug, did you want yeah. to get into one of these? Sure. So I'll talk a little bit about how I have my solution set up on my sailboat, although it's constantly changing. But uh, over on the left hand side here, you can see I have a typical sailboat you know, where do you put an antenna so that it can be free and clear of all the clutter, uh, stays, um, masts, booms, things like that. So I mounted a pole on my Davit system. You can see it on the second picture there and put a, a Peplink Mobility 42G, which is a combo uh, LTE 5G antenna with dual, dual Wi-Fi elements plus GPS. So um, sort of covers all the bases. And from that, I have about 15 feet of cable leading into my aft cabin, uh, where I have a BR1 Pro 5G connected. And then I have an Ethernet cable into my forward cabin, the, the main salon area. Uh, and there I have a, a separate access point. So um, if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> this sort of lays it out um, in, in a little more detail. And this is a pretty typical setup for a recreational boat, regardless of whether you have a sailboat or a powerboat. Um, you have your, your main router as the foundation, 
Uh, in this case, I'm using the BR1 Pro 5G. Um, I have the mobility 42G connected to that, or I could be using, for instance, the 40G, the new Maritime 40G, if I really want to prioritize getting the absolute best um, long range connectivity on cellular. And then I have my ethernet cable led to the forward cabin. So something like this is, is sort of our bread and butter. This is what most of our customers start with something like this. And you can, you can actually build on this, uh, adding additional access points or, or different antenna strategies, but this is a good um, straightforward way to start. And I would also say the access point is kind of optional. Um, it really depends on your boat and the size of the boat and the, the build of the boat. Um, so in some cases, just starting with the router and the antenna is a great way to, to start your solution. So now we come to my insane setup. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have a core router in the MBX Mini 5G, which is on the right-hand side there. That is uh, a dual 5G router. Uh, with uh, dual Wi-Fi. It's got two WAN ports, four uh, LAN ports, of which they are all power over Ethernet, uh, and a lot of other great features. It is uh, pretty new to the market uh, and is extremely fast, so it's got a, a lot of good horsepower under the hood in there. So I have two Maritime 40G antennas connected to that uh, for the two cellular radios that are in that. Uh, and then I also have uh, a third-party uh, a four by four antenna connected to uh, what you see below that, which is the max adapter 5G. That is an additional 5G radio um, that I have plugged into a USB port on that. Uh, and then I'm showing a max HD1 dome. I have a, a CAT18 dome plugged into one of the WAN ports. But really for this solution, this is, this is designed for somebody who is doing lots of work from the boat that needs to be connected all the time that needs a high performing solution. So I have a dome, but I also um, oftentimes will have a satellite connection connected to one of those WAN ports as well. Uh, and then the other two antennas that you see there are the Maritime 20G, and I have those connected to the Wi-Fi ports on this router. And so I'm not using the Wi-Fi directly on the router itself for the local network. I'm using those two antennas to grab those two remote Wi-Fi networks that I'm currently connected to. Uh, and then inside I have a switch uh, with a couple of access points. Uh, and then a SIM injector connected that allows me to um, use different SIM cards in different place, places there uh, throughout that architecture. So this is what I would consider to be a complex yacht setup for a fairly decent sized boat. Um, I'm about 60 feet. Uh, you could you know, lop off a few things if you were on a smaller boat, um, but this is you know, a fairly expensive solution that's designed for um, being connected all the time in a, a pretty high intensity situation. Hey, Steve, why don't you talk about the SIM injector a little bit and how that works? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the SIM injector is a fantastic product. Um, it, it came into being with the domes. Uh, and if you have a dome, it can actually power the dome. It comes as a bundle with the dome if you buy it actually uh, correctly. Uh, which I'm sure Doug knows the part number, but uh, uh, the SIM injector's purpose in life is that it holds eight SIM cards and you can then assign those to different devices that are connected to it. So in my case here, I have the MBX mini and the dome and I can switch between whatever SIM cards I want to use uh, just uh, that are all housed in that SIM injector just by typing a few things into each of those. So that means I don't have to run upstairs to the router, move SIM cards around, put things in different places. I have the SIM injector down in the pilot house and I can pop different SIMs in and out. Um, and it, 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 for the domes, I highly recommend it because you don't want to be going up and opening up a dome every time you need to change a SIM card. But for these bigger installations as well, it's super nice to be able to have that in one place and be able to use SIMs all around. For me, obviously, for testing, it's also fantastic. So, and Steve, I think you just published an article on your blog that goes into a lot more detail on all of this as well. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And including some background on why I chose the MBX Mini and the Wi-Fi as WAN stuff and, and the different performance pieces. You know, there, there's a lot of people who have already commented on it and have said, well, why can't I just buy a BR1 Pro 5G? 
you can, and that's a fantastic product. And that was what I had prior to this, but I, I need multiple, multiple connections. Uh, so I, you know, this is really kind of that high end, uh, piece that you can put into place. You don't have to have all of these things, um, but starting with the MBX Mini and a couple of really good outside LTE antennas, and you have a top of the line solution that you can build on really easily. Yeah, it just comes down to you know where where you're going, and if you want it to work every single time, no matter where you are, there you know you just you end up finding those those gaps or those uh, you know places where you just need a little bit more, and you know yeah. it can add up for sure. I'm not saying it, it's the right fit for for everybody, but for some people, it's completely worth it, right? They're, they're on, you know, very important, you know, very uh, consequential business meetings. And if that's the case, and you want to do that in, in a very remote location, it, you might have to spend some money to get there. But I, th I think the thing that a lot of people overlook too is, you know, they spend a, a lot of the times people spend, I'm not saying the exact amount is this setup, but you know, they, they look at the cost of, of one of these solutions and they say, that's just too much money. I'm just going to get a hotspot. And they end up spending just about that much money just with trial and error, right? They buy this thing, oh, it didn't work. Okay, they bought this thing, oh, it didn't work. And so, again, I would just encourage people to really kind of do the research and, and think about, you know, how much effort do you want to spend fiddling with all this and instead of just kind of finding the right fit for what you're trying to do? I think yeah, you can say the other, that, yeah, that's the, a, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I was just going to say the other, you know, key thing with this solution is is the dual WAN, and in fact, you uh, you ultimately have four possibilities for WAN coming in on Ethernet, uh, two USB Ethernet, and two uh, Ethernet uh, WAN ports, um, and and this becomes important as other new technologies come along. So let's say Starlink finally get their act together, and you can do Starlink on a boat. Um, that could be plugged into the WAN port on the MBX Mini here. And you could have a dome plugged in on the other WAN port. And the, the, the key thing here is that this is your central controller for your whole network infrastructure, the, the MBX Mini. It can control you know, which path you take to the internet based on application type, based on quality of service, based on lots and lots of different rules. And that gives you lots of flexibility for, for growth in the future. Yeah, and that, you know, Doug, I think that's a great point because what you just said actually applies on the BR1 Pro 5G as well, right? I mean, that's got a single 5G connection. It's got the Wi-Fi WAN option, so there's two, and then it's got that Ethernet port. So that's a third WAN, whether that ends up being Starlink or an HD1 dome, right? You've got the ability to kind of build on that base of that that BR1 Pro 5G without looking at, you know, five figure type of type of price ranges. So it, it creates kind of a a baseline platform that you can build on even with that uh, much lower initial investment than something like this. Yeah. I think I'd, I'd like to say one final thing on like cost in general. Um, I, and D Doug and I have had many conversations about this, but we have a lot of people, you know, when they come in and they say, Oh my God, I'm not going to pay $1,500 for the BR one pro five G. And then they go off and do what you mentioned, Travis, which is try a bunch of different things and then come back and buy it. Looking at something like this, you know, this is significantly more expensive. All, I, and usually I'm at a boat with somebody working on this at the same time they're doing other work. And I hear that they're spending $90,000 on Garmin chart plotters and $15,000 on new, you know, wiring in these areas. And they bulk at a $1,500 router. If internet is not that important to you, then that's fine. If it's one of the five top things on the boat that you're using, which it usually is, you need power, you need it not to sink, you need some sort of internet connectivity, you need engines to go places, then, then make sure that you understand that just like everything else in the marine world, this stuff is not like buying a $99 router on Amazon. You're not going to get the same uh, performance and usability out of it. And it's a smaller market. So Peplink doesn't ship 9 billion routers a moment, right? So it costs more to manufacture and make. So you have to pay more for it and you get what you pay for. Yeah, and I think the, the last point on the you get what you pay for is, I don't know any other vendor out there in the industry that supports their devices longer than Peplink. And I'm talking software support, firmware updates, right? We... We maintain support so much longer than any other router vendor out there. And so, you know, it, it's a big investment, but 
it's also one that that we don't just run away from as soon as the next technology comes out, right? We we work as hard as we can to keep those things in support and 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 current so that they are still useful. So I think we've gone a little bit over time here, but I'm I'm able to stay on and help answer questions. Um, Doug and Steve, you're welcome to stay on as well. And so I just want to kind of open it up to the floor. But number one, just thank you everybody for spending the time here. If if you can't stay, and thank you, Doug and Steve. For sure, this is this is awesome to have all this ground level information. But yeah, I think we can open it up. I'll scan the. I've answered screen. 34, I think, so far, or maybe you've nice. been answering too. But I've been trying to answer a lot of them. Um, I know there was one uh, at the very top that you might want to answer, Travis, that had to do that was from Christopher George. Okay, let me look here. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. So this is a great question because there, there's a lot of buzz around 5G and hardware capabilities and, you know, generations of 5G, right? We're, we're just kind of right beginning to see 5G deployed, but there's already kind of new generations of, of chipsets out there. So I think a couple points on that. Number one, routers are kind of the last devices to get chipsets in, in the cellular industry, right? iPhones and Androids. They're the first ones to get it right they're the ones buying millions and millions and millions of unit right they've got the the latest and greatest technologies locked up for a year or two guaranteed right out of the gate and so yeah you're going to see a phone with a newer generation chipset then then you'll see a router with every time right that's almost guaranteed and so there's really no way around that number one um number two it's going to take time, right? These module vendors have spent a ton of money and a ton of effort to get these 5G modules out there when they did have access to them. And so you're not going to see these next generation modules commercially available, I don't think until probably late 2023, early 2024. Just the, the life cycle of these products is not a flash in the pan, right? These module vendors invest tons of money hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars just in certifications alone, forget the manufacturing costs, right? So they've got a life cycle that they have to kind of let play out before they're going to see, you're going to see a new generation of, of devices out there. And then on top of that, we have to then go get those devices certified on top of the modules and the chipsets getting certified. So there's a whole sequence of things that have to take place before you can actually buy it. And, you know, on top of all that, oh yeah, it has to get manufactured too, right? So there's just there's just a big lag in the router industry compared to what you see in the cell phone industry. So, you know, you'll see data sheets and you'll see press releases, but again, the commercial availability, the reality is it's going to be quite a while before you see those next generation chipsets actually showing up in the router market at all. So, you know, like we said, there's, there's tons of reasons why 5G works great today. And may, maybe today's routers aren't the latest generation of 5G chipsets, but they do a heck of a lot more than the latest generation LTE chipsets. So I don't think you're going to be really uh, missing anything for for quite a while if you if you jump onto 5G right now. Again, it's going to be a handful of years before you really start to see another generation of that in the router market. There are a couple questions. Um, I think it was asked about three times. I tried to answer them, but I figured you probably would be the better one to answer specifically about um, the roadmap, uh, and in particular, the dome. Uh, is there going to be a 5G dome and any other details behind that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we did a business update webinar a couple of weeks ago, which is, you know, usually it's more partners that, that attend that. And so I'm guessing there's a lot of new people here that, that weren't there on, on that webinar. But we did, we did announce there's going to be a 5G version of the dome. Um, I think that's probably going to be available sometime sometime summertime i'm guessing um it's going through the manufacturing side we've got the certification side still to go through so there's going to be a little bit of a lag lag there still but absolutely there is a 5g dome coming but it's kind of more like mid-year i would say it's not going to be a next month or or the next two months i, I don't expect but definitely we understand we 5g domes are very important to to people out there yeah, I mean, we talked about the domes in the slides and we kind of breezed by it um, a little bit, but they are very, very popular. Um, I was just think, talking to Doug earlier this morning and the dock that I'm on, there's five installs that that um, that I've done. There's seven installs total, but five of them are domes. They're just so much easier to install in a lot of cases. 
Um, so yeah, seeing a 5G version obviously will be will be great for people so they can take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, I see one question from a Mark out there. He said he's got an old BR1 Mini, kind of interested in the BR, the BR1 Pro 5G. Um, sounds like you're having troubles keeping the Wi-Fi consistently connected. I, I guess I'll, I'll say two things, kind of two contrasting things here. Number one, there's a huge difference in the Wi-Fi that's built into the BR1 Pro 5G versus the BR1 Mini. The BR1 Mini is 11N single stream, which means it just has one antenna. And it's 2.4 gigahertz only, which 2.4 gigahertz is the free, the, the spectrum on Wi-Fi most likely to get congested and interfered with. So you've kind of got three, three negative aspects to the, the Wi-Fi on the BR1 Mini. Um, if you look at the BR1 Pro 5G, it's Wi-Fi 6. So it's the latest generation of Wi-Fi. It's, it's a MIMO antenna strategy. So you've got just more resiliency and, and you're able to overcome interference a little bit better and it's dual frequency. So it's 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz. So you, there's a lot of aspects to the, to the BR1 Pro 5G that are very much superior to the BR1 Mini. And so those things alone might be enough to allow you to continue using just that one device instead of having to separate it to a, an, an external access point. But at the same time, when you get more speed on that BR1 Pro 5G, you might still find the need to add that second access point. So I'd say start with start with the device only, but just understand you might still want to upgrade to add a, a second access point there to separate those two. I'm looking for other ones here. I think Doug and I are both <laughs> frantically typing as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one other point about the dome, um, and I've had several customers do this and, and have been very creative and sort of getting the benefits of the dome, but with the current technology, and that is um, using unused satellite domes that are on their, their large vessels, um, basically putting the router in there, in some cases putting antennas, in there as well, or putting antennas side by side on the on the arch beside the the satellite dome. Um, it's a great way to get the antennas very close, um, get super high quality antennas up high, get it to the router, and then run Ethernet uh, down to the access point in the cabin. So there there are lots of ways to sort of get the benefits of a dome concept with today's technology and certainly if you if you contact either steve or myself we'd be happy to help map that out for you i see another question about uh different generations of our products and the footprints that those are in um is peplink going to stop changing footprints of the different modem devices how soon until we have a one u type standard for hardened devices so uh, the answer is sometimes we do change them and sometimes we don't um you know it's it's a challenging thing we very much understand that you know people want to have just kind of a generational replacement right and so you know some there, there's plenty of examples of where we've followed that and kept been able to keep that exact same footprint like if you followed us years ago we had a device just called the hd4 that was our four radio device and then we came up with the hd4 mbx the mbx looks different right it's a different color it's a different material but it's the exact same footprint, all the antenna connections are in the same locations. And so in that case, that new generation device was a drop-in replacement. It's a 1U device to a 1U device, exact same footprint, just a little bit different look. Um, our transit products are also going through a hardware life cycle change right now. And those will have the exact same footprint as well. So we definitely try to maintain that footprint, but sometimes it's a different product and it's a different footprint. And so, you know, it's not always possible for us to do that, but at the same time, we do appreciate that that is important, especially when you're you're trying to kind of upgrade and keep keep your installation clean and, and sane from one generation to the next. But sometimes we just can't do it, right? Sometimes you just can't get all the new components in there, or for whatever reason. But but we do appreciate that and try to try to maintain that wherever possible. See a, a question from Captain Ed Harvey, both in Q and A and in chat. And I'm not sure that we can answer this, but what is the power output of a Max BR1 Mark II? I assume that's power output. Um, it, maybe you can reply back to your own comment, but power output of the LTE side, or are you asking how much power it uses? So I don't know that we can answer that without a bit more information there. Um, yeah, on, the, on the cellular side, I can just say it's 250 milliwatts. That's a, you know, in, in the US, that's an FCC mandated limit. So you can't have a cellular device higher than that. Um, 
on the Wi-Fi side, I can try and find. That depends on the which version it is, right? I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Uh, Samuel, you ask a question. Uh, is there any Peplink partners with marine experience in the southeast versus Puget Sound? Southeast of the United States, I assume. Uh, I we have there's all sorts of partners around the U.S., but ah, uh, Florida, gotcha. Uh, we uh, we consult with. I mean, I talk with people all around the world. So does Doug. We might not know the 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 conditions in that particular area uh, as much as we do up here, but they're very similar. So the usually what changes is there's a provider that does slightly better there than up here, um, uh, which over there, it's usually Verizon and AT&T that's slightly better than, uh, than T-Mobile up here. T-Mobile's invested a lot in their infrastructure. The same process that we go through for determining you know, what to recommend, uh, it's the same whether it's here or there, really. So it depends on what you're specifically looking for in terms of experience. We're happy to chat with you about, you know, how, what, you know, what solution that might work for you. But if it's like about cell providers or specific local conditions, um, we might end up wanting to connect you with somebody else in that local region. I might have there, um, probably only about a third of my customers are from this area. The rest are um, all over the, the U.S. on both coasts. So, you know, happy to help out there. Um, the other thing, just on that power question, the another question I get a lot of time is how much power... Uh, will these consume? And so a lot of these routers are rated at sort of the, you know, 12 to 18 watts of, of power consumption. But I've done some measurements myself, and they're typically well under half that in real world use. Um, I think Peplink's pretty conservative when they do the ratings. So certainly not, um, uh, you know, a, a situation where you're going to drain your batteries by just having your, your router uh, active. Yeah, and we're trying to be a little more real world on our data sheets. You know, previous figures, we always just stated the worst case scenario, right? And that's usually right at boot up, right? When the router's booting up and the modems are turning on, that's usually the highest draw scenario. And then it kind of stabilizes to a more kind of nominal or average use case um, or, or draw as it gets, you know, sorted out. And so now we're trying to kind of list both of those figures on, on the data sheet. So more and more, you'll see two figures there. And that's that's basically what those two figures are referring to. So most of the time, it'll be that nominal draw. Fractions of the time, it'll be that that worst case scenario. And then if you're really pushing hard on, on the data and the POE, you might see it kind of somewhere in between. But hopefully that helps kind of gauge expectations on that. I, uh, I, I flagged two more for us to answer here. One was from Bob Snyder. Are there any good prepaid cellular plans or is it best to stick with the contract plan? My recommendation is actually to use prepaid cellular plans. And the reason is they generally will offer those for hotspot or data only plans. Uh, they'll be fairly inexpensive uh, and they generally don't have as many rules or controls around them when it comes to rate limiting and what have you. They'll say, you know, like right now I have one from T-Mobile and one from Verizon that are both um, prepaid cellular plans. They're not connected to any other account that I have. They're relatively inexpensive and they're between 100 and 150 gigs of, of, uh, of 5G connectivity per month. So that I have several articles on that. And anytime another provider comes out with one of those, I usually try to publish a, a new article because those are the ones that we generally in the industry recommend when you see them jump on them. They're, they're, um, they're really great. And as long as you make sure you pay the bill every month, uh, they last for a very, very long time. Um, the other, the other question, nice, oh, yeah, the other nice yeah. thing with that is, you know, I have a prepaid AT&T plan. I have a couple of T-Mobile prepaid plans. Um, having two different carriers is, is a really good idea because as you're cruising, you may find some areas are much better with Verizon and AT&T becomes kind of the champ for signal strength. And then, you know, T-Mobile will take over and having the ability to, um, you know, tune your device to be, be able to connect to the best connection based on different carriers is a really good strategy. And to be honest, the, these plans are getting to the point where they're quite affordable now, $50, $55 uh, for, for very decent data plans. 
Um, now with Verizon just yesterday announcing they've certified the, the BR1 Pro 5G, um, you can now activate that device on their network. So there's there's lots and lots of options out there, but I agree with Steve, prepaid is, is kind of the way to go. You can turn it on, turn it off. Although when you get some of these really good deals, it's, it's worth hanging on to them because as we've seen, for instance, with T-Mobile, they changed the initial 100 gigabyte plan to a 50 gigabyte plan. Um, if you jumped on the 100 gigabyte plan, you know, you're grandfathered in. And I, I will just throw one note of caution on the prepaid. We, we have just this week, we've seen some, some customers having issues with AT&T prepaid plans or Cricket Wireless, which is a wholly owned brand of, of AT&T. Um, it, it's, we don't know exactly what the problem is yet. Pe some people on these prepaid plans have gotten notices that they have devices that are 3G and they're, they're not compliant with the network now. And you know, these are all LTE devices that we're talking about. And these are all devices that we've gone through the required steps and changes with AT&T to make sure that they remain compliant. And so we don't fully know why some of those people have experienced this problem yet, but uh, specifically on this issue, we are working directly with AT&T to try and understand if this is a change in policy on what, what devices are allowed on prepaid plans, or if this is an unintentional mistake that has caused this. We, we just don't know yet, but it's not limited to PepLink. We've seen reports from many other sources out there that other vendors are, are also seeing the, these types of disconnects happen. So, um, you know, prepaid Prepaid is definitely going to, you're going to find the best, best value there, but every now and then it can be kind of a moving target as well as the opinions or uh, you know, policies of the carriers change. Sometimes they're a little bit more restrictive of which devices are allowed and which ones aren't. But again, this is why we've got people that deal with this every day to understand which ones do work well and which ones, which ones don't. I would also want to call out uh, Chris Dunphy is actually uh, attending and I just see, saw he posted a note here. The Mobile Internet Info or Mobile Internet Resource Center um, is one of the best spots that I use even to keep up with things. They have more people, more time, <laughs> uh, and they track all of the different plans that are available. There's a great matrix of that. Uh, they have a forum and other things you can participate in if you're a member, uh, but they're usually one of the first groups out there that start to see problems uh, with prepaid plans, postpaid plans. There's uh, Verizon stuff that's getting canceled, other things that are that are happening in the industry. And they're usually one of the first folks to see that. Um, if you go over to, uh, it used to be rvmobileinternet.com, but you can also go to mobileinternetinfo.com. Uh, they have articles and updates on all of that as well. And it, it does appear to be a mistake that they've sent those terminations out, but it's still scary. And again, it comes back to what Doug said, have multiple plans. I have one from every carrier. I actually have three from every carrier on purpose because I figure at some point, one of them is going to get canceled and I, I need all three carriers so that I can do my job and be out wherever I am. So if it's that important to you, it's really not that expensive. It's just time consuming to keep up with it, which is why it's, it's good that we have folks out there that can kind of help us with that. Yeah, I don't think I've seen more comprehensive coverage of different data plans specifically for these types of devices than than what Mobile Internet Resource Center has on, on their yep. site. Definitely just high quality, just ground level, boots on the ground type of information. And, you know, that's it's just a whole community of people trying to do the, the same things, stay connected when they're on the move. Yep. And I'd, I'd highly recommend you you get a subscription for their, their premier service because they have a lot of content that you can gain access to with the, their subscription. And I send a lot of customers there who want detailed information on just about anything, so. Yeah, they have great guides too. Like somebody asked a question about a booster and I don't even bother writing anything anymore. I just send them to the booster article over there that, <laughs> that tells you why you don't wanna use that for majority of things. And they spend a lot of time simplifying it so that folks who aren't nerds like us that start talking about milliwatt speed, you know, and all these other different things can understand the technology. And I think that's a, a great, a great community for people to, to participate in, especially if you're just starting or if you're getting into, you know, spending more money on a peplink router and you really want to understand what's going on. It's a great place to, to start. Yeah. And they, they cover 
lots of different vendors, right? Like I talk about Peplink all day long and I, I think we're great, but they cover not Peplink too. And they help just identify kind of what's good for this and what's good for that and what the what the distinctions between them are. So you can better kind of understand why the price points may be different or, you know, just better understand what, what's available in the market. So, you know, I would encourage people to, to check out that and, you know, get that, get that perspective. There's a bunch of questions I've flagged uh, to answer live. So there's, uh, we could probably just knock out a few of these real quick. What about bonding? If the 5G bandwidth is 200 megabits and I use four cellular cards, the total bandwidth will be 800 megabits. Theoretically, yes. You're never going to get that all the time. And if what you're trying to do is get to 800 megabits, um, I'm wondering what you're doing on your boat. But uh, the bonding and speed fusion and those sorts of things, we talked about that very briefly or we talked about it, but we briefly mentioned that it's more about staying connected all the time than it is getting massive download speeds. Um, so yes, you could get there, but um, you really what we're focused on is being connected all the time. Uh, there's one from Jeff about data plans and traveling to Canada. Yeah, T-Mobile caps on five gigs on some things, but they have some plans that are higher than that. Verizon is the same, AT&T is the same. The last two years, they really dropped the caps um, really, really low as well. Um, we're not really sure why, uh, but the hard challenge with that is you can't get Canadian SIMs without a Canadian address in some situations. So you're forced with using Wi-Fi as WAN in, in, in local um, marinas if you're stopping uh, or use features uh, within the Peplink router. I did an article a few years ago on controlling your bandwidth, uh, shut off things like photo uploads and all the other crazy things that every you know computer uh, does. You could set metered networks on Windows machines and do things and try to eke out you know, that, that data. Um, but ultimately, if you aren't a Canadian, it's harder to get um, a full plan from them. Um, so it's a little Can bit I of a thing. jump in and add just a couple of things there as well. Um, one thing uh, to think about as well is, is Google Fi. They, they operate on the T-Mobile bands for, for data devices. Um, they're not the cheapest game in town, but the nice thing with Google Fi is they have the same data plan no matter which country you're in. And so it's, it's predictable. You can stay connected. Um, used to be they had some uh, maximum amount you could pay and then you know, it was unlimited after that. They now have some data caps in place, but I've used it in Canada without any issue. I've used it in Indonesia, Philippines, Mexico, Caribbean, um, and your device just keeps working. Um, no SIM swapping and whatever. So that's uh, an interesting one to explore. The other thing is T-Mobile have uh, a business plan um, that now includes Canada and Mexico um, for $50 a month. And it's 100 gig for $50 a month. So if you need more information on that, um, uh, you can contact me at onboardwireless.com and I can give you more details. A couple more here. You mentioned speed fusion bonding is a key feature. Yes, I think it's critical. Do you need a license uh, to proper for activating proper load? All the routers we talked about today come with speed fusion cloud uh, on a trial edition. I can't remember what it is. I think it varies by device, but you don't need to buy speed fusion bonding as a feature. It comes with the, with the router. Um, and then you pay for your usage. Uh, and it's really, really reasonable. It's much cheaper. Maybe I shouldn't say this because I don't want Travis or Peplink to increase the price, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, very reasonable. Um, you know, it's, it's multiple hundreds of gigs for, for like 30 or 40 or 50 dollars i can't remember it's on a sliding scale depending on a few different things but it's really really quite inexpensive and the thing to remember with speed fusion cloud is that you can pick what you want to use that so for instance i've picked zoom i've picked office i've picked google work workplace those are the only things that use speed fusion on my boat the random web browsing that i'm doing in the netflix session that someone is running elsewhere aren't gonna use that. Um, you can if you want, but that's just gonna end up using not just more speed fusion cloud data, but if you're using two cellular connections, you're going to be using double the data potentially uh, there as well. So it comes with it and then you can add and remove capacity as well. It's pretty easy to use. Yep, and you know, 
we priced it as low as we possibly could on purpose, right? We want people to use it, right? We want it to be an attractive solution for people. And so I'm not promising it will always be that price, but we want it to be in, in range for anybody who needs this type of solution, right? That, that's, that was really the point of Speed Fusion Cloud. You've been able to do Speed Fusion for years in a kind of do-it-yourself, build-your-own infrastructure model, but most people can't do that. Most people don't want to do that. And so Speed Fusion Cloud is the easy button. And, and really, again, we're trying to make it as approachable to people, price point and technology-wise as possible. And I, I should probably just add that, you know, speed fusion and in control and warranty and all of that is all included in the price for the first year. Um, in control is something we haven't talked about, which is another fabulous tool for managing your device when you're away from the boat. So for instance, on my at home here, I can go and look on my boat and see that my rudders are working. I can shift the uh, priority on the connection, that sort of thing. So there's a, we've really just touched the tip of the iceberg as far as uh, some of the capabilities uh, of these solutions. There was a question from Rick um, that's actually one that I see a lot, which is do these communication devices conflict with systems like Time Zero, Furuno, Radar, Hotspots? That's actually a pretty common uh, question, and it's not just Time Zero or Furuno, but Garmin and Raymarine and all of those others. Those are usually separate on purpose, and the chart plotter marine electronics world has kind of gotten stuck in the 1990s when it comes to Wi-Fi. Um, they, a lot of them have modernized it, but the reason that in particular Furuno and, and some of those don't allow you to have those join other Wi-Fi networks is because they don't trust those other networks. They don't want to have to test that and they aren't going to say yeah sure go ahead and use that and now you're relying on some other third party unit when you're navigating or changing a course or something like that so they don't conflict with them um, you just need to separate them uh, you can run time zero and furuno through switches and through the 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 peplink products using technology called vlans and stuff like that but they're not going to be able to piggyback on that Wi-Fi um, unless it's just to do, you know, chart updates uh, and things like that. You can't use them for the actual navigation side of things, which is a big question that I get answered or asked a lot um, about all the other chart plotters as well. Some of them can, but generally keeping them separate is, is important for a lot of reasons. I might add there that some of the uh, AIS devices like the Vesper products and track products that, and AMIC products that have Wi-Fi built in, they can join an existing boat network in client mode. Um, and that actually is, is quite interesting, especially with the new Vesper Cortex, you can join it to your PepLink network and um, uh, access that data uh, from remote if you've got a VPN to, to your home or office and that sort of thing. So I, I you know, on my boat, I've got a, a Vesper device uh, connected to my PepLink network. And that, that way I have a single Wi-Fi network. Um, as Steve said, many of the chart plotter vendors, though, don't allow you to go into client mode to join in a, uh, a foreign uh, Wi-Fi hotspot. So, um, you know, it, it's really kind of hit or miss. But, but some of the newer devices out there do allow that uh, ability to join a, a boat network. There's a lot of other questions that we're probably not going to be able to answer that are specific about this particular uh, dome or sim injector limitation. One of the things that I have always loved, I, I think I went back and thought about this. I think I've used Peplink stuff now for like 15 years, which is a long time back to when it was just Pep Wave, I think. Um, uh, one of the things that's fantastic about the, the Peplink side of things is the community on the forums. Uh, so while we don't obviously want you to go there and get frustrated by posting basic questions and trying to get support on that, there's a, a wealth of information there about, about different things uh, that you could you know, go and read as well as uh, participate in if you've got a particular feature request. Somebody asked about a, a, one of them that, that I'm also interested in, the 5G Max adapter and the lack of cell phone or cellular information, which is something that I know is being worked on. There were lots of questions about SIM injectors and disabling this, that, and the other thing. The forums are a great place. Plus, you can also you can also contact us directly, and we can work through it with you, or you can contact support um, through your 
your reseller or through uh, Peplink directly too. Yeah, I, I can't I can't say it enough, Steve. The forum is the right place to to continue this conversation because we do watch it, we do listen to people. It may not appear that way all the time, but there are just hundreds of examples. I can point to just about any feature on our router and tell you who requested that and who needed that. And, and so th those, those are things that we watch. Those are things that we definitely keep track of. And, you know, it may take longer than some people want, but we do follow through on these. And so I understand there's some, there's some kind of drawbacks with the SIM injector or some, some features that may seem small, but are actually kind of a big deal to people. We do understand that there's a shortcoming there. And so weigh in on the forum, right? There's other people who've brought these things up and the more people that, that mention those things, the, the faster you're gonna see, see those turned around. So, you know, hang in there. We do listen and, and that's really something that I think is unique about Peplink. Our engineers will get in there and talk to people directly, right? We don't hide behind the curtain. We're, we're, we're not ashamed to say we, ha we don't have everything figured out perfectly yet, but we're, we're always working on these things. And again, that's where that, that long-term firmware support come, comes into play and, and some of those things too. So hang in there and speak up on the forum. Where there's The other thing is there's just so many real experts on the forum too. You'll be just amazed at some of the information and, and solutions that people will just offer up on there. So if you haven't been there, register, check it out and join the conversation. There were a couple of questions as to whether we're going to do this more frequently. I know Doug and I have talked about doing deeper dives into things like antenna placement and cable length. And then, I don't know, I think I say every other sentence, oh, I should do a webinar on that. So yeah, I mean, we'd love to hear from you guys what you'd like to see more as well. So if there's something in specific you want us to delve deeper into, drop us an email, post something in the forum, get a hold of one of us. Um, because we we would rather do this and have it recorded and have multiple people be able to get that information than have to say it every 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 day multiple times. So, and I think yeah. one of the things is you know not not there are no two situations that are the same. It seems you know every boat situation is unique. Every workload uh, requirement is unique. So. Um, well, we talked about a couple of solutions here today. Uh, there are literally dozens and dozens of combinations of routers, antennas, dual routers, dual, uh, you know, it um, is definitely worth, you know, sending us a quick email to, to ask about, you know, what, what's a recommended solution for your particular need and or post it on the forum. You'll get lots of, uh, lots of feedback there as well. All right, folks, I can't, can't thank you enough. We had a ton of people join and there's a ton of people who's hung on here still to the end. And so thanks so much for, for taking your time and, and listening to us. And thanks again so much to Steve and Doug for putting all in the, all the time in preparing for this and, and helping out with, with this. This was a, a great presentation. So thanks to everybody. Have a good thanks, day. Thanks, Travis. Yeah, thanks for having us, Travis. All right. Bye, folks.